The last few years have been tough for most economies, especially the so-called BRIC nations, which had seen phenomenal growth. As problems have risen, expectations have been reduced and questions have also been raised. So how does volatility hurt business, especially startups in emerging markets? And what are the lessons entrepreneurs should remember? As part of our series Lessons in Strategy, we asked a panel of our special guests these questions. Joining us were Harsh Mariwala, the founder of Marico and one of India's most respected entrepreneurs. KB Srinivas, the CEO of Reliance Commercial Finance, which has invested in more than 70,000 SMEs. And Varun Agarwal, an MIT graduate and co-founder of the startup Aspiring Minds. Taking the master class with a room full of entrepreneurs was Harvard professor Dr. Tarun Khanna. I opened up the panel by asking him if the dream run was indeed over for the BRIC economies or is this just part of growing up? I think it really is part of growing up. If you look across space and time, history across different developing countries, this is the process through which institutional development occurs. There are spurts and experiments, withdrawals, learning, more experiments, taking stock, and we really are in a secular rise that has to do with the distribution of talent across the world and the fact that the so-called developing countries, the emerging markets, were locked out of the world economy for geopolitical reasons for many decades. And we are in this corrective phase where we are beginning to catch up and taking time to build the institutions. Um, but I think that March will resume uh, fairly shortly. I'm quite confident that's how institutional development occurs. The other pivotal point around your, uh, which has been brought up by your studies, Tarun, is the fact that uh, you know, evolving, fast emerging economies throw up a, a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs are essentially coming and, and actually filling up gaps. Is that an ongoing journey in a, in a growing economy like ours? So let me explain what I mean by the term institutional void. Uh, you know, recently I was enmeshed in this very interesting academic and business opportunity in China. There's been an ongoing uh, contaminated food scandal where poisoned milk was distributed to lots of kids across China. And you know, hundreds of kids got sick, many died. And the Chinese solution, of course, was to put a lot of people in jail, um, and worse. Uh, but even so, the reason that happens is if you think about uh, a mother buying milk for her child, what is the mechanism that you have to ensure that the milk that you buy is not contaminated, is not poisoned, is not adulterated? In China, what happened is you had people adding melamine, which is an organic substance that appears to raise the protein content of the milk, but ends up actually damaging your internal organs. The issue is that there is no specialized intermediary that can validate the content of the milk that can assert that, look, Mrs. Consumer, um, you can trust this milk because we have certified it. That is the void that prevents the buyers and suppliers of good milk from coming together efficiently. And when you don't have access to that sort of intermediation, that sort of specialist input, you end up worrying about what you're buying. So to get to your comment about opportunities, the opportunity is, here is twofold. One is the filling of the institutional void by some entrepreneurial action. This gentleman here is an example of that with aspiring minds, as I'm sure he'll describe. Uh, and the other is entrepreneurs have to figure out how in the absence of these specialist intermediaries, they compensate for these voids in the first instance. And those two structural characteristics are really all that you need to know to understand emerging markets over and over again. It really is that blindingly okay. simple. Uh, Mr. Mariwala, you've lived that, really, because you, uh, uh, your family owned uh, a commodity oil business, uh, yeah. which you transformed into a brand and a compelling yeah. brand. Uh, so were you filling an institutional void? And what are the challenges when you fill an institutional void of that scale in India? I think the key thing is to identify the right opportunity and how do you drive that opportunity through innovations. And if I look back at my own history, which goes over the last 30, 40 years, you know, there is a certain market for a certain product or a category. And you see that, yes, there is a potential. The market is likely to grow, so the market size is likely to grow. And more importantly, you have an innovation where you think you'll succeed. So I think innovation has played a very important role, at least in my own journey, rather than filling an institutional void. And I still feel that for any business to really to succeed, you have to have the right quality talent, the best quality talent which is required for that particular business, for that size, and then top it up with innovation because in a continuous set of innovations, because by the time you complete one set of innovations, others will copy you, then you need one more set of innovations. And then now with the emergence of modern trade now, all the supermarkets, you have a threat of private labels. And if you don't do that, then you'll fall back. Kimi, what is the sense that you are getting? Because you know, when you talk about uh, 
entrepreneurship in India, the tendency is to look at the more new age uh, companies that are suddenly getting a lot of mind space and a lot of money, you know, in terms of funding. What's the sense that you're getting from the broader framework of SMEs, especially? I think uh, a lot has got to do with the, uh, with the ripple effect of uh, a certain amount of slowdown because if it starts at a core, then it kind of spreads uh, uh, outwards. Uh, so while in the initial stages, uh, a lot of the SMEs did not get affected, but they did have an issue in terms of their extending cash flow cycles and so on. So there was a certain amount of stress on their cash flows. But today it's come to a state where uh, growth and demand is becoming a big issue. So obviously, while uh, the, the, the experience that we have had in terms of the SMEs mortality is much better today than what it was in 2008-9, where actually the, the issue was reversed, that the smaller guys died out, the bigger ones uh, actually uh, managed to stay put. Today it's been the, a little reverse. The larger guys have got bigger problems than the smaller guys. Probably because the way, uh, maybe in 2010-11, in the larger guys invested a lot of money to uh, scale up for a, a growth phase which probably didn't come. Uh, going back to your issue in terms of this new age or the e-com or the IT enabled kind of uh, this thing is concerned. Yes, uh, a lot more of the highly educated people are getting into that uh, phase probably with a valuation game in mind or whatever. But I think there is a crying need for us to invest a lot more into the real economy, the manufacturing and so on and so forth. We have become a little too lopsided in terms of the services orientation in, in even in the SME sector. And that, if we uh, somehow correct through some kind of policy initiatives or creating a kind of a, a, a better marketplace for these people to market their goods, it would be a, a pretty uh, a good initiative to take. We will uh, touch upon that theme with uh, Professor Khanna, but uh, one, let me get you in here. There's a glamour of, of doing a business and starting up. There's also the flip side where few people talk about. One year after you started Aspiring Minds, you actually faced the biggest crisis, right? You had an uh, IT slowdown and pretty much your entire clientele fell off. <laughs> For, for, from a startup's perspective, what was that period like? In fact, 2008 and 9 were very tough, and it was not clients falling off. We couldn't get any clients on board because everyone we went to said, hey, it's a great product, it's a great test, you know, but we are not hiring. So I think what helped us in those two years uh, was two things. Uh, one, that we made the organization really thin and just uh, barely keeping the cost very low because we had raised a, uh, an angel round in 2008 and we didn't want the money to run out uh, by the time the economy comes back. And the second was, which was a blessing in disguise, was uh, that it helped us diversify. So though the IT companies were not hiring, the more local businesses, let's say in banking and microfinance, were still hiring. And though initially we had thought about the product only in the way that how it will cater to IT industry, we had a much diverse portfolio at that time okay. where we had personality assessments and assessments in other domains. So I think that way it was a blessing in disguise and it was end of 2009 where it suddenly everything changed and companies started hiring okay. in huge numbers and then there was a new problem that we had to double the number of employees in three months. The problem lies with the entrepreneur himself because he is so much in love with his business, he is not willing to delegate, he is not willing to trust others, he is not willing to have a team. brings us to two big challenges for entrepreneurs, Tarun. One is really surviving a storm, and the second is to scale up, because you've pointed out many times that the biggest problem in a business is not getting an idea or testing an idea. It's really how do you replicate that, the success of the idea in a larger canvas. Well, I think the two challenges are the extremes on this panel, right? <laughs> One is the capital side, uh, particularly risk capital. The more you veer towards risk capital, we don't really have any systematic way to do it other than friends and family and angels. Even now in places like Bombay, as you know, we have these angel networks that are popping up. And they're okay, but it's a long way from actual price discovery for risky assets. So if you come up with an idea like, like Varun did or some, some other entrepreneurs does, I see a lot of my students in the, uh, in, in the audience who are busy building companies, it's pretty hard to match them with providers of uh, capital the way we would do it, let's say, in Boston or in Silicon Valley but there's a much more liquid market for risk capital. So that's the first. And the second is his business, which is how do you find the talent? Once you have an idea and you're capitalized and you're looking for good people to join you, somebody has to have the stomach to join you when our society doesn't have the, uh, shall we say, the safety nets to protect that person when as is very likely that business goes bust. Because let's face it, most businesses do go bust. And the ones who survive are the ones who are sort of serial uh, 
um, I was going to say serial insanity, but serial <laughs> optimist might be, another, might, might be another word, and are willing to come back and try it over and over again. So talent and capital, I guess, are the two. Would you agree with that? Talent and capital? I think what Tarun is saying is basically the environmental issues which are impacting growth. I am talking of internal issues which the entrepreneur has to deal with himself. And I am presuming that the business model is arrived at, the business is profitable. But in my experience in dealing with entrepreneurs, I have seen that the problem lies with the entrepreneur himself. Because he is so much in love with his business, he is not willing to delegate, he is not willing to trust others, he is not willing to have a team. And he wants to have a very highly centralized way of doing things. Now, when you're small, you can do things. But when you grow, you have to get things done from others. That means you need to recruit good quality talent. You need to create that image in the job market. So there is, there is a real shortage of talent. But the employer has to create a good talent value proposition. And he doesn't believe in doing that. So I think <coughs> issues of governance, issues of leadership style, issues of managing Partners, you know, and I've seen that especially in family managed organizations, where there are more than one family member as a part of the organization, there are three or four, or if there are three, four partners, there are conflicts between them in terms of should we be ambitious, should we not grow, should we grow, what is the role played by each of them. So there are internal issues which need to be resolved, and I think these are the kind of things which come up. To me, lack of capital, lack of talent is something if there is high degree of ambition, if there is good business proposition, it can be easily overcome. But these internal issues with the entrepreneur himself is not realizing are the key issues which are, which are impacting growth. And I believe growth is very important. But for growth to occur, I think it has to be profitable and sustainable. It cannot be just one year grow, next year fall down. You know? mm. Kevin, what are the biggest mistakes entrepreneurs make? Because as a financier, you've got a magnifying glass uh, on whatever they do, right? And you are the biggest check on them. What are the big mistakes entrepreneurs make? I think first thing is uh, to be a little too enamored of your own business idea. Uh, essentially what happens is that, uh, they, and, and therefore what you do is that you fail to see trends emerging which could be actually mortal to the business. And this is one. Second one is uh, not using the right kind of money for the right purpose. Having no distinction between personal money and organization money. And, and that to my mind is nothing but governance. And that's the be all and end all of governance. So, like for instance, our collection guys get very excited and worried if there is a marriage in somebody's family, you know, <laughs> because there could be a necessary diversion of funds. I mean, and that that is governance to me. Okay. Uh, the third factor is, I mean, it's always going to be a very big challenge. Uh, while it is nice for us to sit in this panel and say, you know, the entrepreneur has to take a long-term view and all of that, he also has to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. So, how do you marry this short-term need versus a long-term desire to, uh, you know, take a a little bit of a long shot on your strategy is going to be a very, very tough call. And many times people only see the short term and say, okay, let's do some jugad and then we'll worry about day after tomorrow. And then that is exactly where they fail. Varun, what was your experience like? Because, you know, uh, it's often said that funding or, or um, uh, VC funding is a double-edged sword. Well, what were the challenges when you got your first round of funding? I think uh, after you got the first round of funding, to be very honest, uh, our investor was very magnanimous investor and probably given him uh, some pocket change which he didn't even have time to manage. So we didn't hear a lot from him. <laughs> you were lucky. <laughs> but we had the benefit of having Tarun as an advisor and he was a check and balance and getting advice. What I generally joke is that in the initial days Tarun would say something and uh, we would sometimes understand it after three or four months what he was saying. Now I hope that that time has decreased, we catch up more quickly. Uh, but I think uh, from a perspective, and as some, have, uh, some of the panelists have said, for an entrepreneur, it is uh, the hardest thing is to run day-to-day -day operations, but also take the long view. You know, you, so you just get so sucked up in the day-to-day -day operations that you're not able to see long-term how things are happening and where the business is going. And uh, from a perspective, when we raised money from Omidya Networks and we then put together a professional board, started having board meetings, that was a very good check on the business every quarter as to where we are going, is strategically we doing the same, uh, the right things, or is it that there's something which is beneficial in the short term, but probably not in the long term. So I think uh, having investors uh, who are aligned to your vision and who are supportive uh, is great. I think for us, it has been, uh, in my personal experience, uh, that has been very, very helpful. Of course, there is growth pressure. And, but I think, you know, if you're running a for-profit venture, there has to be growth pressure. I think that's how it works. Just to supplement what people were saying, uh, what I suspect people like Varun would find very helpful is just having a network of people to talk to.
mm. just on a daily basis because it's a very lonely job is to be an entrepreneur and sit in a you know sit in your cubby somewhere with one or two other people and build a business uh, and to find people to talk to i think to the extent i would have added any value it's basically to introduce him to others many of whom are i can see in the room who can be sounding boards and bad ideas back and forth in fact that's exactly what you're doing with assets yeah. right i think thanks tarun i think you raised the right kind of path for me to <laughs> take carry on this insight that it is very lonely the fact that entrepreneurs can learn from each other made me start this uh, this initiative which i have called ascent which is accelerating and scaling enterprises we have uh, 300 entrepreneurs now uh, with us and what we do is we go through a rigorous selection process we uh, ensure that they they have a viable business they are ambitious and they want to share their learnings with others as well, as well as they want to learn from others and they we put them in groups of about 10 but the most important thing i require from entrepreneurs is that high degree of commitment because if somebody is not committed this will not succeed so the meeting schedule is fixed at the beginning of the year on this particular day you'll meet in this month for 3 to 4 hours and normally a meeting starts with uh, some sort of an update check in as we call it so what happened in my business last month and that will throw up a lot of issues i may have a strike on hand or i may have problem with my potential partners or whatever else and then the whole group pulls in you know uh, in terms of what would i have done if i had if i was in your situation so basically what we are trying to do is we encourage a lot of peer learning in a fixed group of 10 and this is a fixed group which meets every month and the feedback from the groups has been amazing absolutely it's okay to fail and to fail uh, let's let's remember one thing every time you fall flat on your face you move 6 feet forward when we talk about aspects of entrepreneurship what what we often forget is that a large bulk of indian entrepreneurship if you move to the sme side is family owned it's closed it's a uh, you know forget uh, getting peer uh, views in it's so tightly owned by the family that very often they don't grow how challenging is it over there and as a financier what are you doing to actually get companies up to speed see it's a, a pretty difficult challenge obviously because uh, you know it it's a, it involves a certain amount of change in the mindset no obviously the traditional mindset is that you know you you stay within a certain amount of close group you don't ever seek uh, outside help in terms of uh, your your problems and issues people are very cagey about talking about their business for the fear of either the tax man coming after them or somebody else stealing their idea etc but over a period what's really happening is that there is a certain amount of uh, opening up which is happening in the minds because of the generational shifts that has uh, really happened because the new generation that is coming in is far more well educated is a little more open minded so that change is happening but it's happening pretty slowly mm. now what that means is that obviously when when you look at uh, uh, a particular entrepreneur from a uh, from a funding perspective these are some of the qualities that actually worry us now so obviously you you go back and see okay what has been his ability to withstand cycles and so on and so forth but if the cycle uh experience is not built up you always take a very conservative view point so in the process what happens is he doesn't get the amount of money that he wants because as a lender you have to play very safe so it becomes a bit of a chicken and egg kind of situation but what we really try to do is therefore uh, to to start a whole series of uh, interactions with the smes and so on and so forth how to uh, change their mindset i mean it's going to be a long haul obviously Uh, starting from very basic things like uh, saying that look it's it's cool to pay taxes so why don't you do that because what you really do is you pay 30% to the government but you keep 70 yourself and 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 with the result that you're bringing in your real cash flows into the books somebody like a vc or a, a private equity is in a position to look at your funding he's able to develop a certain amount of confidence in your capability and your honesty and maybe he will give you a certain amount of additional growth capital which was pretty difficult to come by even as early as, as late as even 2 3 years ago now things are kind of opening up no i think this example of uh, you know the reluctance of the entrepreneur to clean up the books is a classic example of the problem right because you have a short term long term issue in the mind of the entrepreneur because he's probably thinking i get an immediate payoff by not paying taxes versus you're send, selling me this pie in the sky story that i'll clean up my books and i'll give it to you and maybe some vc will look at it and fund me and the truth is that there has to be a tipping point where enough numbers of people are doing that so that every individual then says okay i can do it also and that takes a while to come about so this is fairly typical we have a few hundred hushes running around doing their own little uh, accelerators that would be very helpful 
uh, if we had the government uh, create some uh, basic, what I would call, information clearing houses, which has been done in many countries, um, that would be very helpful. Um, so there are a bunch of simple steps that we can do, copying other, copying other countries. I mean, you know, Chile in Latin America has done an amazing thing with startups, just putting some very, very basic institutional infrastructure in place that has shown payoffs in two, three years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, I go back to my core point, is that these institutions take a while to develop. There's just no short, shortcut to that. But there are things that we can do, either as individual financiers or entrepreneurs, uh, or as policymakers, if we have an eye towards what the problem is to solve. Let's talk about the other issue that you raised, which is scaling up. Right. What were the challenges that you faced? Because is it just a question of money? You know, in my mind, and again, this was brought up in the panel and sort of talked about it, is uh, uh, one is the team and getting the right team and getting the right mid-management. You know, so when you're small, you're doing everything yourself. There are a number of activities which you're doing yourself. You can look after it when the scale is small. And as the scale grows, you need to be able to build this really good mid-management who can be owners of these different things. And I think uh, both from the point of view of being able to attract good people, uh, attract them from good brands and um, to join startups is challenging. Uh, making the right hiring decisions mm -hmm. is very, very challenging. Uh, for a large company, if two executives out of 100 fail, it's fine, it's 2%. For us, if out of five people, two fail at the mid-management mid level, you have wasted like six months. In my mind, in scaling, the biggest challenge we have faced, and now we have overcome it to some extent, is to how do you make sure that your day-to-day -day processes are running? And as an entrepreneur, you don't have to, you know, your day job is not to just be able to deliver to the client. And that's not what you, is the worry which is, you know, waking you up at the night. But what is really waking you up at the night is how do I take this forward, grow ex exponentially, so on and so forth. So if I put one finger on one thing, it would be the team. Prof. Kana, to sum up, for entrepreneurs who've gone through a pretty rough patch over the last couple of years and uh, are questioning the great promise of India and the billions of entrepreneurs that you talk about, <laughs> what would your advice be right now? Stick it out. That's it. Stick it out <laughs> in spite of your... The there's a lot of upside. This is a good time to buy, whether you're buying talent or raising capital or looking for opportunities. Um, and if you want to be a different kind of entrepreneur, there are a lot of semi-distressed assets uh, available right around here. Within a mile of here, I know of some that are available. If somebody wants to buy and turn them around, that's an entrepreneurial story. Yeah, uh, He'll finance it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Harsh will mentor you. <laughs> and well, you'll join the network. You guys are all set. And we'll cover you on Bloomberg, right? <laughs> that's right. It's a great system we got going right here. So you're all set. <laughs> Mariwala. Well, what is your advice uh, to, to entrepreneurs? Uh, after having gone through that journey yourself and uh, also mentoring some of them, what is your advice? No, I think entrepreneurs are adding a lot of value to the society. I've said that you need to have a compelling proposition. You need to have a business model which succeeds and then go out and take some risk and scale it up. You know. Mm -hmm. Kimi? Uh, I think it's okay to fail. And if you fail, uh, let's, let's remember one thing. Every time you fall flat on your face, you move six feet forward. So that's the kind of mentality that entrepreneurs need to have. I'll let you have the last word, Varun. Uh, you could have uh, been in a comfortable job after MIT, right? I mean, you started out, uh, you've gone through some ups and downs and uh, tough turns. Was it worth the ride? And uh, what's your biggest learning uh, for, from the last couple of years? So uh, I think it was definitely worth the journey. I and mean, I think it's a steep uh, learning curve in, uh, you know, uh, Doing business in India teaches you a lot. And if in the kind of business we are, which has an operational element, it's not only online. You know, there are a lot of things which you face. Thankfully, we don't do anything with the government. So I think uh, that way uh, that helps. Uh, and we're not in an industry which is regulated. Uh, I think uh, the biggest learning is that uh, it's like I'll again allude to Alice in Wonderland that there's this queen who says that you have to keep running to be at the same place. And I think that's what startup is about. Right, on that note, thank you gentlemen for joining thank us you. today. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.